So I'm uh, Alfred Hero, and I'll be uh, chairing this panel. Uh, the way the panel is going to work is that uh, each of us is going to give uh, a, you know, a five to 10 minute uh, a kind of overview a position, if you like, uh, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions and then um, uh, discuss uh, if uh, the, uh, uh, the questions are, uh, uh, are not uh, eliciting the kind of, of, of uh, panel discussion that uh, I'm looking for. I'm going to open it up with some of my own questions. So uh, to, <laughs> to, to keep this uh, uh, sort of on track, um, I would propose that uh, all questions be postponed until all of the speakers have had a chance to speak. Um, and uh, that way, we can sort of segue very, very naturally into the, uh, into the panel. So this panel is on uh, data privacy and security, and I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to, be, to be chairing this. It's a uh, very important area uh, within uh, the uh, uh, human side of uh, data science and for fi financial institutions, of course, in particular. Uh, before I launch into um, uh, what I'm, uh, my, my few remarks and introducing the, uh, the other panelists, uh, I want to uh, use my position as the co-director of the Michigan Institute for Data Science to put in a plug for another meeting that's coming up uh, in November, on November 15th and 16th, um, on uh, big data advancing science and changing the world. Uh, we have some fantastic speakers um, that uh, include uh, Robert Groves, the 23rd uh, director of the U.S. Census Bureau, now provost at uh, Georgetown, and uh, in, a, in addition to Siddharth Batterjee, who's uh, chief of the Center for Big Data Research at the, at the Census Bureau. Um, so I uh, hope to see any of you uh, uh, who are interested in the broader aspects of big data from methodology through um, uh, applications in transportation, computational, social sciences, uh, personalized health, um, and uh, analytical learning. So, uh, of course, uh, we have been living in a world where, uh, uh, when I was a child, uh, privacy and data security looked like this. And uh, we had uh, a single point of entry. Uh, the firewall was a bank clerk, um, and uh, admission was based on personal recognizance. There were no um, passwords. Uh, there was a physical key. Today, of course, um, we are now in a world which is uh, much more uh, open and um, uh, where data is being uh, transmitted, shared, stored, um, and information extracted from that data uh, is a bit of the Wild West. Um, unlike uh, in uh, uh, scientific research with human subjects, there is no uh, a nationally accepted consent policy uh, for um, uh, ensuring that uh, the, uh, the public uh, uh, retains uh, uh, a trust and is protected from, um, uh, from let me say, uh, poor practices. So um, this now is representative, of course, of uh, what this panel is all about. And uh, with increased uh, availability of data across the, the ether, uh, in the cloud, uh, and uh, uh, stored in uh, a third party uh, uh, storage of media, uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, lots of issues that arise uh, that uh, uh, involve cybersecurity, intrusion detection, uh, uh, ensuring uh, privacy, ensuring uh, the, uh, uh, the safety and stability of our financial system. So uh, big data, of course, has had an enormous uh, 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 role over the past uh, a few years in, uh, in, in commerce uh, and uh, society, uh, but in particular in uh, fin financial services. Um, of course, data has now become a, a commodity with which we can um, uh, try to improve services uh, by bartering and trading and selling information uh, about um, our clients, uh, about competitors, and um, uh, that has, of course, given uh, a lot of uh, advantages in terms of um, uh, being able to better uh, perform, for example, cybersecurity, uh, so intrusion detection, network pattern 
uh, our recognition and pattern analysis. Uh, IARPA has uh, announced recently a new program in developing an early warning system for cyber attacks that's uh, based on uh, a variety of data, including social media data, um, uh, that uh, can be used to uh, detect uh, type uh, incipient uh, uh, behaviors that might lead to um, uh, unconventional, unanticipated attacks. Of course, fraud detection in the credit uh, uh, and, and banking industry has uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, benefited from the ability to uh, use uh, uh, and, and leverage uh, information from, from social media, email conversations and interview notes and so forth uh, to be able to uh, predict trends, um, identify hidden relationships, um, and uh, then eventually uh, detect, uh, again, uh, patterns in the network of interactions among different uh, dimensions of the big data scope uh, that might indicate uh, that there is anomalous uh, and perhaps fraudulent uh, credit uh, uh, card activity, for example. Um, customer segmentation and targeted marketing are, of course, other, other areas where uh, uh, big data has been uh, uh, very, very useful. So those are the sort of the areas where we've been able to identify uh, where big data is going in the positive direction. Uh, and of course, it, with every um, uh, uh, improved uh, uh, activity uh, that uh, occurs in the use of uh, large amounts and uh, diverse data um, uh, for these uh, types of uh, objectives, uh, there are risks. And of course, that's what this panel is all about. Um, the uh, challenges that we're facing um, effectively um, can be divided into uh, uh, several categories. I'm just going to focus on a couple, uh, ensuring security of data and then protecting the privacy of data. So, of course, uh, we've, uh, uh, we're all aware that uh, uh, attackers are getting much more sophisticated. Um, there are uh, dozens of, uh, of attacks reported uh, you know, every day on um, uh, infrastructure, including uh, uh, banking, uh, finance, uh, and trade infrastructure. Um, the most common cyber attack uh, is the uh, 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 distributed denials of service attack, of which we heard just uh, uh, less than a week ago about the attack on the, uh, uh, the DNS infrastructure that controls uh, the, uh, the switchboard uh, to the internet, uh, which was uh, attacked by recruiting big data, uh, which can be uh, uh, defined in this particular case as any opportunistic uh, device that's connected to the internet that might be used to generate uh, uh, requests uh, uh, to, a, uh, uh, to a server uh, through its, uh, 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 its, its internet or HTTP port or what have you. Um, and of course, the, I, the Internet of Things botnet has now uh, become a, a, a tool uh, for um, uh, attacking sites and bringing down um, uh, networks that are of uh, critical uh, uh, importance to uh, the functioning of our financial system and of, in general, of our economic, uh, social, and, and uh, uh, secure uh, national um, uh, situation. So. Um, Protecting the security is, is clearly a, a very important issue, and I hope we'll be able to explore some interesting themes over the next uh, uh, hour or so. Uh, privacy is the other part of the coin, the other side of the coin, uh, where, uh, of course, uh, we look at privacy both in terms of uh, uh, privacy in terms of proprietary um, uh, data and, and when data is, is being shared that uh, companies, uh, institutions, uh, are confident that their data will not be uh, used for a nefarious purpose uh, against them or unfair competition. Uh, but also, of course, there's consumer confidence, which was brought up in a question uh, to the previous speaker um, on um, the uh, need to maintain uh, the uh, public support and public trust in our institutions. And um, I just collected a few statistics from a recent uh, report uh, from the, uh, the Pew uh, uh, Charitable Trust, uh, which um, uh, 
reports that uh, only 38% of Americans trust their credit card companies. Uh, they don't have confidence uh, that the cre their credit card companies will make a serious effort to maintain privacy of their data, um, which uh, might sound uh, uh, quite uh, low, but it's actually pretty good if you compare to uh, the um, uh, confidence in, uh, uh, for example, uh, search engine providers, uh, social media sites, um, or uh, government services in general, which is about 31% confidence uh, uh, in, um, uh, the, the, in, in government uh, uh, websites and, and uh, government uh, institutions like the IRS to, uh, uh, to keep data uh, private, secure, and uh, protected. So uh, clearly there's an uphill um, uh, uh, battle here in uh, trying to uh, maintain or even regain trust uh, and uh, I'm uh, certainly uh, aware that, uh, you know, it would probably only take one major uh, breach of trust in the financial sector that's well widely publicized to bring these numbers of 38% down into the, uh, the, the bottom uh, of the pile. Uh, and so um, I think that this is a clearly uh, an issue. Um, the other uh, aspect that I just want to bring up is the importance of um, recognizing that privacy is not monolithic, that uh, there are various um, ways that uh, privacy can be um, uh, protected and that it, it can be abused. And there's, a, I think, a, a, a nice uh, characterization of uh, these uh, challenges that one faces as um, uh, a, uh, uh, someone who is entrusted uh, with uh, protecting uh, private data. Um, and uh, those are the four R's, reuse, repurposing, recombination, reanalysis, uh, which are um, uh, a analog of the, of the four V's of, uh, of big data. Um, but uh, these basically refer to the, um, uh, if, if back to the, the sort of IRB consent uh, type of, uh, 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 of interpretation for uh, research, scientific research, these uh, correspond to uh, data that's, that's consented for one purpose um, and then it's reused for some other purpose uh, for which that consent does not exist. Uh, or uh, reanalysis is when, of course, a, uh, a, a subsequent analysis perhaps of uh, other uh, consented or, or unconsented uh, personalized data uh, uh, is combined with the analysis of, of, of the original consented data to say re-identify uh, or de-anonymize the data and, uh, and then of course uh, uh, the, the public uh, loses uh, their trust in the ability of the institution to uh, protect their, their assets and resources which they entrust to the, to the system. So. Um, uh, with that, I will uh, uh, conclude uh, my, my overview and um, uh, uh, introduce our, uh, our speakers. Uh, so uh, we have um, a, a panel of, of four uh, very complimentary and distinguished uh, uh, panelists here. Uh, Peter Swire uh, from uh, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, professor of law and ethics, uh, was, uh, ha has been teaching banking law uh, was privacy czar in the uh, Clinton administration, worked in Obama administration uh, on the Do Not Track program. Um, and uh, he'll be talking to us about uh, uh, trade-offs between privacy, uh, security, and, and, and commerce, uh, the, the, sort of the individual good versus the social good trade-offs that occur um, in, um, uh, in, in privacy, in particular as, as associated with, with finance uh, industry. Uh, and then uh, Jonathan Katz, uh, who is a professor of computer science at the University of Maryland, directs the uh, Maryland Cybersecurity Center. Uh, he will be um, uh, talking about uh, uh, basically how one computes securely without uh, you know, leaving any one party with all the data so that uh, uh, one can uh, look at distributed uh, approaches uh, using bits and pieces of the big database that you need in order to, say, um, uh, do your um, uh, customer uh, 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 search and development 
but uh, not to leave any, any uh, a part of it uh, exposed uh, to um, uh, a breach of privacy. Um, and then uh, we have Mike Reitbat, who's the co-founder of uh, Forter, uh, which is a company that uh, prevents online fraud uh, for uh, credit card transactions. Um, and um, uh, he'll be telling us about how uh, credit card fraud really is, a, is an arms race uh, to the bottom uh, and, and ways of, of, uh, uh, of, of counteracting that, uh, that trend. And then uh, John Carlson, who's um, a vice chair with the Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council, the FSCC, um, will be um, uh, talking about some of the existing cyber threats with uh, 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 case studies on particular malware uh, strategies that have been used uh, to uh, uh, usurp uh, the uh, uh, security measures that have been put in place uh, within uh, the internet and, and other networks. So with that, I'd like to uh, call up uh, Peter uh, to make a few remarks. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Hero, and my thanks to Michael Barr for the invitation and for being part of this, this great conference today. Um, my topic in less than 10 minutes will be big data and finance, privacy, security, and discrimination issues. Um, and uh, the timing is great because on Monday night I'm supposed to teach for 90 minutes from the same deck, but I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to give a different version, I think. So that's for a financial analytics a grad course at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, so much of this conference, as I think has been said, is on the benefits of big data, and that could be sort of an endless list of that. And this session, as we just heard, is about some of the major risks, and so I'll briefly talk about uh, data security, data privacy, and data discrimination. And to do that, I, I encourage you to think about a case study. If you were working for a big financial institution, let's have an all-customer funds database. Uh, it would help our uh, customers uh, uh, know about their own financial things. It would help our brokers give the right products to the customers. It would have everything about their profit loss balance sheet. It would have all their accounts. And so if you think of this as we go through the conference for the next two days, it's a wonderful big data tool. We'll get great analytics out of this, everything about each customer. And we'll have great analytics about the company to figure out what our wonderful new products should be. And more data is better because we can do all this great stuff. Um, and so if you're thinking in a financial system and you think about our biggest financial institutions, this might be a helpful just model in your head to say what would be great or what would be risky about having all the customer data put together in this way. And for analysts, for the people who do the big data, this, this is a great temptation to something like this if you're in an organization. So uh, here's my, my slide. I'll say more, but big data is good. Big data breach is not good. Right? I mean, that's, that's sort of the thing. And so if you have the enormous big data, you get all those great things, but a big data breach is a little scary. So let's just think about it from the point of view of this all customer funds, fabulous database in our big financial institution. So when I talk to chief information security officers or business people, I ask them to consider, consider the consequences to their customers if this database is hacked and put on the internet. Let's just post it all on the internet, WikiLeaks style. One thing that could happen is there could be fraud, and we'll hear more about that. The hacker could pretend to be Mr. Barr and take all the money from his account. Mr. Barr might get sad about that. <laughs> there would be identity theft. They could impersonate Mr. Barr by knowing the answers to all those secret questions. How much was your mortgage payment in this state? You know, what was the other financial things you get asked on the high quality secret questions? What if, uh, as a hypothetical, Mr. Barr will one day to be a senior government official and might be of interest to nation state attackers, as John Podesta found out this summer? Are your defenses ready for that? Because if you have this wonderful database and you have one interesting person in the database, now you're a target. And, you know, in terms of job security for the CISO, what if the CEO of your company has her information in it and it all gets revealed? She might be unhappy with you. So these are some of the harms from a big data breach. Uh, it's not just hypothetical. These were things that real customers, real people would care about. So you hear sometimes the idea of a big data lake as just this enormous big reservoir of data. Is that a good way to think about it? 
And so in computer security, people have talked for a long time about the M&M &M defense. That's a hard, crunchy exterior and a soft, chewy middle, right? You get through the crust and then, oh, it's all that wonderful, squishy, soft stuff you get to enjoy so much. Um, not a great defense. Uh, most cybersecurity people don't like that at all anymore. A firewall is not impregnable. There's too many holes in it for too many reasons. So if you can't have an M&M defense with that soft, chewy interior, what do you do? Well, one thing you do is a data segregation strategy. One attack shouldn't get everything. If they get into one part, they shouldn't get everything. A second thing is data masking. Most analysts trying to do the cool numbers don't need to know the names of the people. They don't need to know their social security numbers. There's identifiers or sensitive things that you can mask and still get the analytic goodness out of it in many instances. And you should consider this, this sort of scary, negative, going in the wrong direction idea of data minimization because there's cost to data as well as benefits. And so there's a decision point about when to add data because if the breach happens, then you have these difficulties. That's what I have on security today on big data and privacy, and, and Professor Hero mentioned both of these things. Big data is a major challenge to the fair information practice of purpose limitation. Your privacy policy in a bank under Graham Leach Bliley says what you're going to use it for. In the European Union and the over 100 countries with comprehensive data privacy laws, purpose limitation is a big, strong legal rule to have to consider as you're doing business there. But I think conceptually, big data is a bigger challenge to de identification or anonymization. And under Graham Leach Bliley or any privacy regime, if it's anonymized, you can go fun and have fun and play with it. But if it becomes non-public personal information, if it becomes the regulated stuff, you've got an issue. And here's how big data helps re-identification. I think for the tech people, this is very familiar. So one thing is you have more data points. That's sort of the point. There's big data. There's more data. So you're going to have all the customer funds database. Plus, let's get their social media stuff, their Twitter feeds, plus maybe from the banking app we can get their location. We certainly can get their public records. So we have many, many, many data points about each individual. We also today have good search. Google was incorporated in 1998, but almost 20 years later, we have really good search. Lots of data plus good search. And if you have lots of data plus good search, you can often re-identify if any of those data points help us re-identify people. The very worst one, never ever tell anybody, is your birth date. Okay, so I hope you've all followed that strategy because 366 days of the year times 80 years it might be, that's 25,000 cells just for your birth date. That means in a city of 100,000 people, on average, three other people have your birth date. That by itself drastically re-identifies people. And then Latanya Sweeney and others have sort of pointed that out over time. Okay, so therefore, don't assume that anonymized information is really anonymized. For more on this, Yodley got in a flap with the Wall Street Journal about a year ago. You can go look at that. Uh, we worked with that. And the Future Privacy Forum that I'm associated with has a project on de-identification that I think has, has good guidance on that. My one slide on big data and discrimination, which will be back in the, in the discussion this afternoon. So uh, a major uh, a benefit of big data is we have all customers' funds. We provide customers exactly what they want matching of what the sellers want and what the buyers want, and we give it to them. I testified for the Federal Trade Commission in 2014 on lessons from fair lending law for fair marketing and big data, and that's available online. And the big law here that uh, people in this room know about is the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And here's just one naughty question to think about for the banking. So there's a history in fair lending of extra advertising. If you were redlining, then go advertise where you didn't used to advertise. And that's been a common remedy against discrimination against a particular group. But extra advertising, if you target it on race or gender or age or the rest, is a violation of ECOA. And so you need a theory of what's the good targeted advertising, remedying past wrongs, and what's the bad targeted advertising, targeting uh, people like uh, uh, GE Capital before it renamed, got hit by the Consumer, Consumer Financial Protection Board for almost $200 million in fines because they didn't give a very attractive offer to Spanish-speaking people and people in Puerto Rico. And they paid very heavily for that. So the wrong targeting is race-based. The right targeting is giving people what they need. There's not been a good theory of which is which. So conclusion, and I'll stop. For big data security, avoid big data breach. Easier said than done. For big data privacy, there's a caution that the regulatory scope can expand enormously because of this risk of re-identification, and then you have to manage it like personal data instead of anonymized data. 
And for big data discrimination, precisely the benefits of targeting may be illegal in this equal credit world, and so we have to think through how we want to do that. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Jonathan Katz. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, what I want to focus on in my uh, brief initial remarks is just to give you some uh, perspectives from the cryptographic community about uh, ways to ensure privacy in uh, data mining and uh, introduce you to some tools that I, I think, I, I assume most of the people in the audience are maybe not familiar with, although some of them you may have heard of before, and uh, really just touch on them, try to explain at a very high level what they can offer and uh, if there are more technical questions, I'll, I'll uh, defer those until the question and answer period with the audience. And I want to be clear, actually, just to set the stage for my remarks, that uh, what I'm going to be focusing on here is specifically the issue of privacy rather than security. And uh, just at a, at a very um, kind of broad brushstroke to explain the, the, the way I'm distinguishing those for the purposes of these, uh, of these remarks, I think many of us are familiar with the concept of security as uh, enforcing a distinction between people who have access to some data and people who don't have access to, to some data. And so it's a binary classification. You're either in or you're out. And privacy is much more fuzzy. Privacy allows for much finer distinctions between people who may have access to portions of data, people who may have, ac who may have access to um, a, a certain amount of um, uh, limited access to data but not complete access to data, Right? And it, it allows for much finer distinctions between what you're allowed to learn and what you're not allowed to learn. And uh, it's useful when thinking about privacy and when thinking about privacy in the context of big data to uh, separate the concerns or separate the, uh, the issues involved into two orthogonal components. And that's how I've structured uh, my remarks here. So the first question we can ask is what sort of computations on big data can be done without compromising privacy? And then the second question is, given that we've uh, uh, understood what computations we can hope to carry out, how then can these computations be done in a privacy-preserving manner? And so let me focus on the first of these in terms of what computations can be done uh, without compromising privacy. And this relates actually to the remarks of the earlier speaker uh, who was talking about things like uh, collecting data in one location and then analyzing it. So here, just to introduce the notation, we have uh, some collection of data x where, just for simplicity here, I'm assuming we have a collection of items x1, x2, et cetera, where just think of xi as being data corresponding to some ith agent, where the agent can be a user, the agent can be a company, uh, what have you. And um, the observation was made earlier, right, that if we collect all this data in one place, we may have to be concerned about the possibility of a data breach, and that's certainly true. And so therefore, you might want to try things like uh, anonymizing the data, scrubbing the PII, but I think really that's only a, a zeroth order defense. Uh, it was already mentioned before that you have these um, de-anonymization attacks, that even if you do simple things like that, uh, those simple techniques are simply not sufficient to prevent somebody from ultimately linking your data to other data sources and, and discerning a lot of information about the individuals in the data set. But one way to view the question about what computations can be done privately is to think, well, if we were going to compute some data uh, on this data set, um, what functions of this data can we say don't reveal too much information about any individual entity's data? So what randomized in general, what functions of this data wouldn't reveal too much information about xi for all i? And there has been a lot of research uh, looking at this question, how to formalize this question, and then how to, how to uh, decide which functions meet the criteria, which, which uh, satisfy the definitions. Uh, I think the leading contender right now uh, for a satisfactory definition of what privacy means in this context is the notion of differential privacy, which I think many of you uh, may have heard of, uh, which basically defines this, this um, uh, defines formally what it means for a computation, for a function of data, not to leak too much information about any one participant, by roughly saying that a, a function of this data set uh, ensures privacy, ensures differential privacy, if it's the case that the function on the data set 
uh, that you would compute is roughly equally distributed to what you would get if you computed the function on the data set minus one user's data. So imagine uh, focusing on some particular user, user number one, for example, the, uh, the output distribution of f computed on the entire data set would be roughly equally distributed to what you would get if you computed f on the data set minus the data of user one. And if that holds for all i, then uh, the function is said to be differentially private. Now, there are a lot of practical issues with differential privacy. Uh, I think many people have argued that it's too strong, and I would certainly agree with that. Uh, there seem to be fundamental limitations in terms of um, how well we can approximate certain, certain questions of interest, certain functions of interest in a differentially private way. But nevertheless, I think it's a useful starting point, and uh, like I said earlier, the leading contender for what a definition of, uh, of a private function should look like. Now, what this gives you, what this perspective gives you, right, it says that if you have some entity uh, who's trusted, who's secure, if you will, uh, and can securely hold all this data, then it would be okay, right, it would be private for that entity to either publish f of x or, or perhaps to use f of x in uh, making some decision, right? Because as we've just argued earlier, the, uh, the, if f is differentially private, then it, the, then publishing f of x or using f of x as part of some decision process isn't going to compromise the privacy of any individual user i. And the problem, of course, is that we don't have a single trusted entity uh, for many reasons, uh, some of which were also touched on in the previous talk. So we may have incompatible trust assumptions, right? I mean, I, I know that I'm trustworthy and you know that you're trustworthy, but, you know, we don't know anything about each other, and so it can be difficult to get around that. Uh, there may also be legal or regulatory constraints to certain entities having access to data uh, that may prevent the collection of data at one single entity. Uh, there's also a liability and a cost issue, right? If you're collecting this data, then you have to uh, spend money, perhaps, to secure that data, and you may be unwilling to do so. Uh, similarly, you may be unwilling to take on the liability uh, of a potential data compromise. And of course, collecting all that data in one place gives the attacker uh, a single point on which, to on which to concentrate their efforts and becomes a single point of failure or a single point uh, of attack. So it's undesirable to collect all this data in one place. Now, this brings us to the second question. Uh, given that we've identified some function that uh, satisfies a definition of privacy, how then can we carry out the computation of that function without having a single entity storing all the data of interest? Well, what we can do is we can imagine distributing that data across multiple sites and or across multiple entities. And there are several ways this can be done. I've just sketched three uh, possibilities here, but they're by no means exhaustive. So for example, you could have one entity storing data about some subset of the users and another entity storing data about a different subset of the users. Or you may have both entities storing data about all users, but it's different data, right? One may be storing uh, financial information, one may be storing um, uh, personal information about those same users. Or maybe in another uh, uh, um, uh, setup, you might have actually nobody storing the data in, in clear, and instead what you have is a situation where one party is storing a, an encryption key and the other party is storing an encryption of the data. So in fact, nobody has access to anything in the clear, and only when you pool their information together can they potentially decrypt and learn anything about the underlying data set. And then, of course, the question is, well, given that we've set up this situation where different entities have different portions of the data, how then can they go about computing this function of interest? And uh, it turns out there's been a lot of work over the last 25 years, actually, in the cryptography community on techniques for doing exactly that. And the protocols that allow you to do that uh, fall under the, the uh, uh, category of what's called secure multi-party computation. And just at a thousand foot level without going into any technical details, I can describe what secure multi-party computation allows. Basically, you can imagine any setup where you have any number of entities. So in the previous slide, I was, I was focusing on two entities, but you can in fact have any number of entities holding any, um, uh, holding, uh, any collection of, of data in any uh, of various ways. And imagine that if you had a central authority, if you had a single trusted entity that all parties would be comfortable uh, in terms of giving their data to, then you could imagine all those parties sending their data to this one central entity and having that entity carry out the computation of the function f that we've all agreed is, uh, is a privately computable function uh, or is a private function. And what secure multi-party computation gives you is exactly the ability to replace that central trusted entity with a distributed protocol run between the parties themselves, the entities that hold the data themselves. And it gives you the exact guarantees that you would have if indeed you had this idealized trusted entity collecting all the data and performing the computation 
uh, on, uh, on these parties' behalf. And so it ensures correctness, it ensures privacy, so no party learns any more information other than the result of the computation. It ensures various other properties as well. And the only thing I want to leave you with is, is uh, just the, the, the fact, the statement, that, uh, like I said, this has been an active area of research over 25 years, and it's known now that, in fact, uh, secure computation of any function is possible with security against arbitrary behavior of any number of the parties in the system. So if you have your data distributed among n parties, uh, they can collaboratively compute the, some function of their data uh, and even be assured that if the other n minus 1 parties are all colluding against them and trying to learn information about their data, they're still, the, the data they hold still remains secure. And so from a feasibility point of view, the question is, is settled. And the only, I mean, the only, but the, but the question that remains is just one of efficiency uh, and how quickly we can actually carry out this computation. And so I'll just leave you, you know, with, with this final picture here, right? So imagine, again, if you're thinking about, uh, and I invite you actually to think about this, about how these techniques might be applied to problems of interest to you. So imagine that you have this collection of data with data stored by different parties in some system. And imagine further that if those parties could agree on one central entity to whom they could all uh, uh, share, with whom they could all share their data and then have that uh, entity carry out some computation on their behalf, then what they could in fact do is get rid of the trusted entity, not have to assume any trusted entity at all, and instead carry out some distributed protocol between them that would allow them to compute that same function uh, in a private way. And for people who are interested, um, uh, I have a paper I wrote a couple years back uh, with the Office of Financial Research, uh, really intended more as a survey paper introducing these ideas, talking about uh, both about the differential privacy as well as about secure multi-party computation, and just sketching out some potential use cases uh, of these ideas in the uh, financial realm. And I think this paper may have been linked from the uh, conference website as well. So uh, that concludes what I have to say. Thank you. Next, I'll ask Mike uh, Wrightbat to come up. Thank you. I, I won't use any slide, that way I can improvise. Uh, the, the main thing I want to do is to give you some insight in how it all looks from the cyber criminals perspective, what they are doing and why we as an industry kind of losing this war for now. The first piece of bad news for you, Alfred, is actually at any given time there are more than a thousand concurrent cyber attacks going on, not just 12. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, not all of them are as massive and get to the news like the, uh, the one last week. But when you look at what cyber criminals are after, and there are mainly four types, we can kind of distribute all of them into four groups. The first ones that are completely not interesting in the industry level is the amateurs or the kind of pranksters. Usually people in their teens or in college, they wanna, they learn something new, maybe in the computer scientist the class, and hey, let's try that, let's try to access some uh, router to try to see if I can change the wallpaper on my professor. This is not interesting. Or steal an iPhone for myself or whatever. The second class is criminals that are making a living off cybercrime. The, they, as a group, cause the greatest damage to the economic system, right? They will try to steal credit cards and then monetize them to get money, get access to bank accounts, get access to other identities and credentials, and they're doing it for economic reasons. The third P group is all the government-sponsored cybercrime, and they're usually trying to get distort the service of another government or some corporation that competes with theirs. And these are usually the massive ones that we all read about. Uh, and all big countries play in that game. It's not just Russia and China. Um, uh, so everyone is contributing some, somewhat to that industry and, and acting very, very creatively with huge budgets. And then the fourth group, which I personally find the most interesting, is the people who do that for the street cred they get on the cyber community. So if, if someone, and I think it happened like five or six years ago, someone filed a fraudulent or tax return on behalf of the director of the NSA. You don't do it for the money, you do it because now you're a legend in the cyber community. <laughs> one, one of the most famous examples that happened when I was a, uh, a teenager is an Israeli hacker uh, hacked into the Pentagon, and the only thing he did there was place his picture as a wallpaper on all of the computers. Now, it gives him nothing, but, and they caught him within the hour and sent him to prison for a year and a half. <laughs> but 
first, everyone knows who he is. Second, he is now a cybersecurity consultant and talks on television. And, and, and he's not one of the kind of best and brightest minds. He's just one of the most famous ones. Uh, Kevin Mitnick, which I'm sure is a name that's familiar here for some, was one of the early people who went to prison for phone pranks. Right? He was basically stealing phone calls and doing some really minor social engineering to get access to data. Uh, and I think, and now he's, uh, he has uh, his own cybersecurity company, he's on television, he uh, sits on boards of other companies. He's a legitimate person, even though he was a criminal and he got famous because of those crimes. And when you're trying to stop that, I think what's, Im what's important to realize is that no individual or no company is beyond being hacked or their identity being stolen. If I want to steal all of Michael's money, I can do that. It may require a lot of effort, so not be economical, but that's why these gr this group of people is so dangerous. They're doing it for something else. Their motivation is completely not uh, effort related. And per personally, I don't think there's anything to be done against uh, them. But all the other three groups, there's a lot we can do. And currently, I think we're, we're dealing in an almost, uh, or not an almost, exactly an asymmetrical warfare. Because if you're a criminal, all you have to do is find one easy target to get money from. Uh, we all remember the target got breached three years ago, 40 million credit cards got stolen. And the person who conducted it wasn't very, very technical. And it was a really big human error. They didn't update some sort, some service for three years, passwords were generic, and they didn't monitor it properly, and here you go, 40 million cards. And as, as the person who did that, he tried to, do, to hack other companies and wasn't successful. So from his perspective, he only needs to find one, but all the companies has to protect themselves against all the MOs and all the people all the time. Because if you get breached once, first, I think the CEO essentially left because of that, uh, definitely the head of cyber, uh, the CISO left, and huge damages uh, was caused there. And part of uh, what we are trying to achieve at Forder and a lot of other companies at this, kind of these days, are trying to go after the business models, after the gross margin, as you will, of cyber criminals. Make it, you can still hack it, right? We, ju we, just, we just said that no one is impenetrable but it will just be so much more expensive than it was before, so you'll probably go do something else. Uh, a good example for that would be, you all probably have a chip card now in your pocket. Chip cards can be copied. It's just so much more difficult. Copying a magnetic stripe, I can buy a device for $100 off the dark web and just copy everything. It's very easy. So a lot of people did that. We introduced uh, the, the chip, now it probably not so simple of a device, maybe it costs a few tens of thousands of dollars. So most people can't do that anymore, so they move somewhere else. Fortunately or not fortunately, fortunately for keeping me employed is they usually go to the online uh, crime world. They never seem to retire or get a decent job. They always migrate. Uh, <laughs> uh, they always migrate, and as we are going and trying to hurt their uh, economics, this is why we try to push them somewhere else. And essentially, as we make everything more expensive for them, uh, it solves it. There was one idea, uh, Peter, we talked about the spam world, uh, one idea of let's charge every email that is being sent a fraction of a cent. When we send emails, it's nothing. You'll pay $5 in the end of the month. When a spammer wants to send a billion emails, all of a sudden it doesn't work. The idea didn't work because you could have couldn't have charged a fraction of a cent at that time when they started implementing. There are actually some Bitcoin-related re uh, applications in that space now. But if we go back to how can we make uh, cyber attacks more expensive for criminals, and this is where big data comes in play. Uh, we now can monitor almost all criminal activity across all websites or assets. Uh, it was not possible, so I've been doing that for a little over 15 years, it was not possible even five years ago, to, the computational power wasn't there. You couldn't have collected everything and monitored it in real time or close to real time. Because what we're required to do now is not just, hey, I have this huge data set of a billion records, 
let's run a model over the night and see what comes from it. I need to make a decision within less than half a second. Do I let this person in? Do I expose this data that he's requesting for him or not? Now, computing this is actually a pretty easily solvable engineering problem. Uh, we, can, we have so much, the, the infrastructure to do that is so accessible and so cheap, you can almost calculate everything you want if you build it properly uh, at almost no cost. Part of the problem with that is cyber criminals also have access to all of these technologies and they usually implement them they, way faster and they try them, uh, they have to improve, right? For, it's a business for them and they move definitely faster than government I'm sorry, and, and, and probably de uh, and, and significantly faster than all the large organizations. So they started using, uh, I think the right name for it now is cybercrime as a service. You see people in the Craigslist of the criminal world, you would see, I have uh, 100,000 computers for rent at $2 an hour. So if I want to implement a DDoS attack, right, a denial of service attack, it's very easy for me. I have access, I don't have to build anything. They share information extremely effectively. Once again, Bitcoin is a, is a great tool that enabled a lot of commerce and cooperation between criminals. Now I don't have to do everything myself. I think there is a statute of limitation on that. So let's say 20 years ago, I had to build all of these things myself. You have to build your own tools, you have to get your own servers, you have to get your own access. Now you don't. You, buy a server from someone or rent a server from someone or a thousand servers, you get a shipping location that someone collected or has access to and, and you transact and everyone gets a piece. So it's an extremely efficient economy. We, there's a lot to learn from them, I think, in the economic sense of things. Sa same thing that goes to pirates 300 years ago. They were way more efficient economically than us. Uh, and the way you make it harder Coming back to the way you make it harder for them is you request, you kind of make one hurdle more difficult for them to create that identity, right? They have tools to, once again, if, if someone wants to create Michael's identity, we're all using you as a, as a target here. I have, by the way, had identity. Okay, perfect. We, we were just preparing for this panel, that, that's all. <laughs> so we, we each of us leaves a small piece uh, of our identity everywhere we go. And usually these pieces are stored there forever. And not all of them are being protected well because you don't think of your uh, university alumni forum as something that needs to be protected. But you probably register there and you have your birthday, right, which is a, it's an extremely unique identifier. Your birthday there, maybe you wrote some stuff about what you like and not, and I can guess the answers to those secret questions. Or I would have, as, as, a, as a creator of that forum or someone who has access, I have those questions and you never change your answer. And you usually use the same password for all of your non-critical, like non-banking related uh, systems. And by starting to collect and assemble one piece after the other, I can build all of your identity. I can create a fake Facebook profile for you, connect to all the people, and they don't, wouldn't understand it maybe, but I'll have all the connections. So I can recreate, and there are tools to do that automatically in the cyber criminal world, recreate Michael's identity online within an hour. If we can make that effort for me as a criminal to do it within a day, all of a sudden it won't be as easy. I can't bounce. Uh, and use that many identities at once. So I have to make sure that every time I use that identity, I get more money for it. Now I have to use it at places that get, gives me more yield or enables me to, to steal more money. There are fewer of them, like stealing $20 is extremely easy. Stealing $2,000 is a little harder. Going after 200000 not so easy, so I'll have to invest in it. And all of a sudden, it's, it's not worth, and this is where we're breaking that. Now, uh, John and Alin, to, to, your, to your point, if we gather all of the data, and data is extremely available for us as the industry fighting cybercrime, right? It's actually a little less available for the criminals, but they're more persistent at getting that. It's extremely available. So in theory, we can have, well, back to my, my industry of uh, protecting credit card fraud, we can have Visa's data, we can have Facebook's data, for instance, and we can have all the merchant individual data, and we at, at any given time, have all the data we need to make the right identity decision of whether you're that 
person who is legitimately trying to do something or not. But once we aggregate all the data in one place, now we're exposed. And, if, and as I mentioned in the beginning, nothing is impenetrable. So someone will hack whatever that system is. And you, that's part of the reason you can't, and rightfully so, a lot of these agencies and companies are really hesitant in cooperating. If they were cooperating, fraud prevention is an extremely easy problem. But they're not cooperating because of that storage of data. And as more of them, I actually really liked what, uh, what you were talking about, as more of them start to implement how do you share information, how do you combine an identity without sh actually sharing any particular data and storing all of it in one place. You almost create an instance of an identity for the authentication period of 300 milliseconds and then it goes away and I can't steal it. So if we can achieve that by cooperating not on the data itself but on the uh, re kind of recreation or re cre recreation of the identity in real time and the, comp kind of the, the algorithm, the computation power is already there. The solutions are there. It, it, it requires more inter-agency or inter-company cooperation than anything else. Uh, and I think if we can do that, and I think we're moving into doing that, there are more and more people that's starting to realize that it's actually important, and it's the right way to solve that conflict between preserving privacy and data versus solving uh, security problems. Uh, so I'm, I started on a worrisome note, and I actually want to end in a, in a very optimistic one, that I think we are moving in the right direction here. Thank you. Thank you. This John Carlson is next. Let's see. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, since uh, one of the advantages of being last is that the other panel members have covered some of the key points, so I won't reiterate those points. Maybe let me first start by just giving you a little bit of background about what I do and where I fit into this ecosystem of big data. And I tend to think of the organization that I'm the chief of staff for, which is the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center. It's a real mouthful. We tend to talk about it in its acronym, the FSI ISAC is that we're almost a little big data fusion center for combining information from voluntary uh, sources. So this is an all-voluntary army representing 7,000 financial institutions. We're now in 38 different countries, primarily in the United States, to, to gain situational awareness of how the threat, threats are evolving, to bring people together to talk about what their collective analysis is, and most importantly, what steps should be taken in order to mitigate the risks. And because of our size now, because of our collaborative nature and the way we actually work with multiple uh, government agencies, we also are now becoming a platform for collaboration and creating new entities to solve different issues that we encounter as we gather more information and learn about the things that we need to do in order to address some of the uh, emerging uh, cyber, but also physical re related threats. Um, so just to give you a little more background, we have very high concentration within the commercial banking side, but we're growing in the other subsectors of the financial services industry, including credit unions, the broker dealers, the asset management companies. We include all the major exchanges, all the major uh, credit card companies, uh, and have a very strong trusted network of practitioners that are constantly working uh, together. What we do, as our name implies, obviously information sharing and analysis, but also uh, threat monitoring and crisis escalation. We have spent a number of years developing what we call our All Hazards Crisis Management Playbook, which spells out how committees within uh, the community have responsibility for identifying a crisis and then activating the response. And we have been working very hard with our government partners to match that up with various presidential policy directives, including the most recent 41 that was issued in July that lays out the process in which the government will respond to a crisis and how they will collaborate with us. Increasingly, we're working across sector, so we work very closely with 
other industries like the electrical power grid, the communication sector. Uh, we even formed an information sharing organization with the major law firms. We support the oil and natural gas sector. We support the retailers in response to the, the target breach. They formed their own information sharing organization a few years ago. So we play a really important role in terms of connecting different parties together. Uh, I also serve as the vice chair of our sector coordinating council. That was a body that was formed after the 9-11 attacks in order to have a strong um, coordination mechanism amongst all the associations and the major um, uh, operators of critical infrastructure. And then they have a partner relationship with the Treasury Department that chairs a committee that includes all the regulatory agencies. In fact, Michael Barr was the chair of the, uh, the, the Treasury Committee, the FIBIC, uh, as, as it's known. We have also been investing in terms of automation and leveraging standards. There's two standards that the Department of Homeland Security through the MITRE Corporation developed called Sticks and Taxi. These are standards that, that categorize the information, that's the sticks part, and then can transport it through machine-readable fashion. And so we've been trying to urge more and more sectors. The government now produces information in sticks and taxi formats. And that radically reduces the amount of time it takes to disseminate information about attacks and to respond to that information because you're, you're eliminating a lot of manual processes that end up taking a lot of precious time. It also allows practitioners to focus on the more difficult risk issues as opposed to the, the noise, the, nu the nuisances that are out there in the, in the environment. We do a lot of conferences. In fact, it just came from Nashville where we had one of our big conferences. Um, and we produce a number of best practices papers, oftentimes in collaboration with government partners. So we've issued several with the FBI and the Secret Service around uh, different types of attacks, uh, various wire fraud uh, attacks, such as the, the business email compromises one. You may have been reading about the attacks on international banks uh, leveraging the SWIFT network, the Bank of Bangladesh was a very high profile case, uh, $81 million. Could have been much worse if it weren't for um, some, some uh, uh, a few details that some of the practitioners at the Federal Reserve and others noticed uh, as they were processing the payments. Uh, but a real need for the industry to be constantly on guard because these types of attacks, and as Michael noted, uh, the adversaries are studying us very closely. They share information uh, very effectively. It's a whole marketplace, and I think he rightly noted, certainly funded through Bitcoin as a vehicle for, for exchanging um, uh, uh, service for fee. Um, a lot of growth international. I've already mentioned uh, other sectors. Um, and then communications. And part of the communications, the piece that we're now working on really diligently is how do we assure the markets and consumers that their money is safe, that the infrastructure is safe in response to different cyber attacks. And we've been conducting a series of exercises. In fact, there was a notice that Treasury put out last Thursday after we had a meeting at the White House with, with uh, a dozen CEOs and heads of all the regulatory agencies in which we talked about the culmination of several years of exercises in which we simulated various uh, different types of attacks. In each of those different types of simulations, we uncovered new things, the new uh, either weaknesses or gaps or capabilities that we needed to enhance or policies that were very unclear on the part of the government, whether it's the regulators or law enforcement or the intelligence community. And we're really working very hard to try to mitigate and build greater capacity and launching a number of different initiatives. One initiative we, we publicly announced on Monday is the formation of a group within the FSI SAC that is comprised of those firms that the government has designated as critical infrastructure to do deeper information sharing, deeper analysis, and deeper collaboration with government partners in bringing in significant new resources into the fight against these different adversaries. This is more of a marketing slide, so I'll skip this, but our members see a lot of value in what we do. I think Michael very ably went through what we see as the major adversaries. Um, obviously, cybercrime is the big one. Nation states is the one that is really causing us the most amount of pause, particularly around uh, malware attacks that um, attack the integrity of the data. And this is a new domain. We're really not sure how this is going to play out in that in the financial services community, like many other communities, we are built on trust and the integrity of data. And if you lose that trust, as we saw in the financial crisis of 2008, being more of a, a credit issue that led to a liquidity crisis, we can see some parallels in terms of the integrity of data in an operational risk 
environment through a cyber attack. So I think there's a, a, a lot of opportunity in this space, uh, particularly in the operational risk world, to kind of better understand these risks, to figure out what sort of mitigation uh, uh, steps need to be put in place, both on the public and the private sector sides, and it is a, a true collaboration. Uh, the one piece that's, not miss that's missing on here is the trusted insider. And we have seen time and time again, the trusted insider is the one that's going to probably cause you the most damage, as the NSA has discovered through Edward Snowden and most recently through another Booz Allen contractor. Um, in terms of what we're seeing of the adversaries, malware, obviously big one, various forms of wire fraud. The, the latest version has been the attack on the individual banks leveraging the SWIFT system. Actually, the SWIFT system was never compromised. It's more the endpoints and the challenges of securing those endpoints. A lot of spear phishing campaigns that we see uh, targeting executives, uh, being very precise, leveraging, as Michael noted, a lot of personally identifiable information that we as individuals freely provide or maybe unknowingly provide through the, the services that we sign up for or the deals, that, the discounts that we get uh, with different merchants and other, other providers. A big focus has been of late on ransomware attacks. Um, this is uh, an issue we're monitoring very closely in the financial sector. It's really hitting other industries much more hard than ours. Healthcare has been probably in the news the most where they encrypt the data, basically demand a ransom, or they'll say, we'll DDoS you uh, if you don't give us a ransom. Many organizations will pay, uh, because if you're a hospital and you don't have access to your data, you basically cannot operate, uh, particularly in a, in a world of health IT. Uh, so something that we've been partnering with the FBI, Secret Service, and others to do some um, outreach on that topic. Uh, lots of challenges within the, the supply chain. Uh, just remember, we're in a world of technology where there are multiple providers. Individual organizations don't actually run these systems. Their service providers do. Having good visibility in terms of those threats is a constant challenge and one that multiple industries are struggling with. And we see in the future a lot of the threats and, um, uh, and um, exploits are going to come through the mobile platforms and the social media uh, platforms. So what we do is bring this all together in terms of having these trusted communities of practitioners where we, we organize based on what our members want us to do. So we have communities that just consist of the payment processors, communities just consisting of the major exchanges like the, the New York Stock Exchange and others. Uh, we've got groups that are focused on small community institutions uh, that, that are dealing with certain types of attacks. So we create these communities in which Folks feel comfortable sharing the information. They have control over the information and in that they can, they can tag it in a way that it can be, be shared but without attribution or it can be shared in a 100% anonymous fashion. That has created, and again, this is all voluntary. I want to make it that very clear. It's very different than what is required in the mandatory information uh, sharing, particularly around FinCEN, which is a treasury uh, uh, agency that requires financial institutions to report crimes, including computer crimes. Um, that is the mandatory side. That is not information we will see. It's what the government uses in order to launch investigations and understand the risks that are out there. We're on the voluntary side, in which we gain a lot of insight in terms of what the threat environment is and share the information gets shared very rapidly. I'll give you an example. The Dyne um, a DNS provider was mentioned. When that hit on Friday, the emails lit up, and our members were sharing very, very rapidly in terms of who was impacted, what they thought the source of it was, what organizations could do in response. And our industry actually has a tremendous amount of intellectual knowledge about this, having been the victim of a major DDoS attack extending for about a nine-month period by a group of Iranian backers. We know this because the Department of Justice issued indictments earlier this year in which they targeted wave after wave of DDoS attacks against about 42 major financial services firms. And that was the event that made cyber, at least in financial services, a CEO level, level issue. The, the uh, target breach made it a CEO level issue within the, um, the merchant and the, the retailer community. So we've been getting a lot of interest in this space. We get a lot of support from the, the CEOs as well as the practitioners. And, um, and I'll just close by just, you know, kind of hitting on a few of the points that haven't been mentioned in terms of um, some of the, the big data related issues. One of the issues with big data is about the pollution of the data. 
and making sure you are not introducing information that can lead you to false positives or false negatives. And that's something that's very important. It's an issue that we've been raising with the Department of Homeland Security with a new program that they've launched called the Automated Indicator Sharing Program in which we have some, some concerns about the level of vetting of the participants that contribute information. So knowing who's contributing, having some information about the reputation of the parties that are providing information is immensely, immensely helpful. Um, I think in terms of the, the opportunity side, um, clearly uh, a lot of good can come from big data, particularly around knowing who the actors are, both the, the, the good actors, people that you're trying to do business with, as well as the bad actors, understanding who they are and how they're proceeding, as well as uh, having better and faster detection of the type of techniques that are coming forward. That's really what we focus on in the sharing community. It's about the techniques, techniques, and procedures. We don't share personally identifiable information. We don't really need that information. We don't want that information in many, in many respects because we really want to understand um, how to protect the institutions. And um, I think Peter did a great job. He's truly the expert on privacy, so I will defer to him on anything having to do with privacy. Uh, but the one issue I would say in terms of the competitiveness and cost is um, these are not inexpensive oper uh, 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 tools. And that puts, in some cases, smaller organizations at a competitive disadvantage. They can sometimes mitigate that by being part of organizations like mine to be a part of an information sharing community to get the benefits of that collective information and mind meld and um, to, to be there at the table to get the information when you need it the most. So I'll stop there. Okay. Great. Uh, well, th uh, thank you all the, the panelists for giving a very cogent uh, overview of many of the dimensions that we're dealing with in privacy and data security. So I now open up the panel uh, and panelists to uh, questions from the audience on any of the uh, comments or any questions going beyond the comments that were made. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Karen Fireman. Uh, John Carlson, I was wondering, uh, when you mentioned the utilities, what type of data are they sharing, and is there a financial implication of that? Um, because it, we could have a disaster, or what, what type of uh, utility information and energy, comp energy information? I mean, they, they, the exchanges would typically share information around um, you know, what type of attacks they're seeing, um, what sort of vulnerabilities that they need to be focused on the most, um, uh, oftentimes just trying to dispel rumors that may be out there in the, in the marketplace. Uh, there's a lot, there's a term we use called FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, so we actually spend a fair amount of time, you know, monitoring the, 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 the press to what's being reported. We monitor social media. Uh, and oftentimes we'll have to step in and say, well, that's factually not true. This is what we know in terms of what's going on in this space. Or to try to correct oftentimes some misperceptions in terms of what's considered a hack versus a breach. Uh, in our world, that's a, there's a big distinction. A breach is something that requires notification uh, and a bunch of different uh, regulatory interactions. Uh, but it's mainly around, the, as I mentioned, the techniques, tacti tactics, and procedures uh, how the changing threat environment is evolving, um, and just making sure there's a trusted, strong community that can respond very, very rapidly uh, to events that, as they unfold. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, about a year and a half ago, there was an incident. There was multiple incidences with an airline company, a major newspaper company, and a major exchange. Um, the the, the uh, social media really lit up. People were started saying it looks like a coordinated cyber attack against these three different industries. Um, and we very quickly got the word out. Actually, the CISO from one of the exchanges got the word out very quickly. It was not an attack. It was a, a software upgrade that malfunctioned. Um, that's why the, 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 it was offline for, for about an hour and a half. And through our coordination with our government partners, uh, the CISO knew ex exactly who to communicate that to at DHS so that that information got transmitted to the White House and within an hour and a half the press secretary was saying it's not a cyber attack, it's a software issue. So having those lines of communication so that we can dispel you know, false rumors is also a very important um, 
uh, part of what we're doing in order to maintain uh, uh, investor and consumer confidence. In the back. For most of the community institutions, they are going to be relying upon a major service provider um, to, to manage their, their IT infrastructure in most cases. Um, so they have you know, the big guns, if you will, behind them through their use of these third-party service providers. Um, that's in general a general statement, but we do see a lot of situations where smaller institutions uh, are very much resource constrained. It is an issue. Uh, they're all heavily regulated, so they're all, they must adhere to similar standards, you know, in terms of security and vendor management and business continuity. Uh, so it is a burden. It, it is the regulatory compliance aspect of cyber is actually significant and growing. As we've seen just recently, New York has issued a comprehensive new rule. Uh, the Fed, the OCC, the FDIC issued a proposed rule, a notice of a proposed rule uh, last Wednesday. Uh, and we've seen through the examination process the regulators are paying very close attention to cyber. I think it's probably their number one, next to maybe credit risk these days, probably their number one uh, risk issue. Um, but it, it is a challenge. And to be in this space, you, you have to have capabilities to defend against these types of attacks because, you, you know, the, everyone's vulnerable. Any other comments? I mean, they, they're, they're having to invest more. That's number one. Um, I think some of the regulatory agencies have been trying to provide tools to help um, those institutions. So there was a cybersecurity assessment tool that the regulatory agencies issued uh, about, a, about a year ago, and that's being, being used as a, as a tool to help organizations. Uh, we've been strongly promoting FSISEC membership. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be speaking on a webinar on Monday with thousands of institutions to just review what we do and how they can leverage the, the community. And I think that's a tremendous resource. In, for small institutions, it's only $250 a year is a membership due. So it's a great way to be a part of a community and be connected at a very, very low cost. Uh, but that's just, for most organizations, that's a fraction of what they need to spend you know, with their controls uh, and the training and the technology and the contracts with service providers. Just really briefly, the, the word cloud can be scary for security because it's out of your control. But if you're a small institution, the ability to build it in-house versus the ability to go to someone who's spending all their time defending. So, so cloud's a big part of the answer. And then I think not only within the industry sector, but within geography, there tends to be tiers of relationships where you can, in Georgia, where I am now, there's a variety of ways that the different people in Georgia talk to each other and the different banks in Georgia do. And so your people can be getting help from the community of folks that are nearby them physically. So another question there? Okay. Yes. Um, Ana Maria Casanis, um, a follow-up of your previous example uh, with the exchange and a few other organizations. In this world of instantaneous uh, exchange movements uh, where institutions uh, of financial players of all sizes move scenes in less than a fraction of a second to wait an hour and a half for something to be identified or called a, a software update. Um, it's almost a joke because when an institution is having a software update, my experience in more than 16 years here at the University of Michigan has been that in my departments, anytime they are going to change anything in the software, I know. It doesn't catch me by surprise. So that in the major exchange, they didn't know 
and all of a sudden, oops, oh, an hour and a half later, we are already dealing with it, we are prompt. An hour and a half in the market is way too long. Is that a statement or a question? <laughs> um, please comment on it. I, I, mean, I mean, what I want to know is, how could something like that take place, considering that everybody knows when they are changing software? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not in a position to defend that particular organization, but I, I will say these technologies, these systems are highly complex, and they are very interdependent. The fact that they work uh, at the percentage of uptime that they work, it, to me, is a miracle, uh, just in general. Um, but, so, but, but organizations do spend, particularly in the financial services space, tremendous amount of time and energy on, you know, the, the, the controls, the backups, um, there are requirements for certain types of firms. You have to be able to be back up and operating within two hours or four hours. Um, these are things that were implemented after the 9-11 attacks. Uh, there are requirements to have out of region, you know, backups, independent staff, independent telecom, independent um, um, uh, communications systems. So, you know, but things do go wrong, and, you know, and being able to respond when things go wrong, both in terms of trying to get your systems back up as quickly as possible, but also communicating to your counterparties that something is happening, that it is a bounded problem, meaning it's a software upgrade, we're working on it, versus it's a cyber attack, we're, we're not sure when we're gonna be back up, we're investigating, the, the, the regulators or the, the uh, law enforcement people are on site, um, that's a different set of issues that organizations need to take into account in terms of how are they going to operate and remain resilient. So, you know, it is a fact of life that we will have failures from a technology point of view, but it is also a, a requirement that firms of these type have very robust programs and uh, well-organized, well-exercised uh, response procedures for when something, you know, unfortunate does happen, because it will happen. Question over here. Notwithstanding the 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 the, the litigation or whatever the confidentiality agreement might say, once data gets um, accessed incorrectly, what could you look at at different agencies or companies? set up, uh, be it a FISMA score or infrastructure, to make sure that you're giving it to somebody that's going to protect it? What, what safeguards or standards would you look at to give you some degree of comfort? I mean, I'll start. I mean, well, first off, if you're in the financial services space, you have to report certain pieces of information, particularly if it's, a, if it's a, a computer intrusion, a cyber attack. Even FinCEN, I think, released on Monday or Tuesday, you know, an additional advisory on, you know, spelling out what you should and shouldn't report uh, and encouraging organizations to share more information on the, on the private sector side. Um, I think what's interesting is what we've been trying to do and what the administration has been trying to do, particularly over the past few years, has been to try to uh, share more information bi-directionally and to try to get the government to declassify more information, to share what's considered actionable information. Um, so for example, we, and they do share information, uh, unclassified as well as classified information. And the government, multiple government agencies have been working very hard to do that and to try to expedite the process. And there have been a number of events that have occurred in which we've encountered situations where a one government agency said you can't share, you know, and another government agency said you should share. And they've become case studies for how we have tried to work with our government partners to say, look, in certain circumstances, you really should not tell the victim party not to share the information because that is information that could be immensely important to others within the community in order to know what to look for. Um, and, and even though there may be an investigation going on, whether it's a criminal action, meaning organized crime, or it's a nation state action, and that's the piece that oftentimes trips up the government, 
because there are different agencies that get involved with a national security event versus a, a law enforcement event. Um, and I think the government's been working very, very hard, and through some of the exercises that I mentioned, we've been trying to really work collaboratively to encourage the government to think whole of government, not, you know, each agency has their equities, they're only responsible for this, but to think about how this is going to impact the economy, the sector, the individual firm, and to respond. So it's a long-winded answer. It's an immensely complicated space. Um, and I think there's still a long way to go, but I think at least this administration has been working very hard to try to work through some of those issues. This question here. Um, what's, let's presume there is a Let's presume there is a, an attack of some kind uh, that, that corrupts a, a market over some period of time, either with respect to individual transactions, uh, Ethereum kind of, of, of a piece, or, or more systemically. What would be the appropriate regulatory response to that having happened? Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm open-ended on this. I mean, would, you, would you imagine a rollback? We just unwind everything till 9 a.m.? You know, th th that, that Thursday never happened. Would we try and have more, more, more individualized um, um, uh, corrections? Uh, I think of the Ethereum circumstance where they essentially organized a posse and, and, and uh, went out and, and just reversed a bunch of the things that had happened. Uh, do we need judicial authority to move quickly? Again, I'm just wanting to speculate a little bit about what would be the, the toolkit for something like the, the Treasury or, or, or the, um, you know, whoever is the appropriate uh, regulatory body to, to have in hand to move quickly to, to, to reestablish or correct or whatever it is that's appropriate? Sure, please. Um, so one thing is in security, it's often taught as CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and uh, accessibility or availability. Inte data integrity has been a problem for computing since the start. It's not a new thing. Also, um, fraud was not invented with the computers that existed before then. So there's been bad data inside financial systems since forever. And so the, I think where the problem is is that there might be extremely clever, extremely pervasive and subtle fraud deep into, you know, who, who owns the, the stocks and all sorts of other things. Um, and there's not going to be some one-size-fits-all, but I think the, the predicate a lot of times will be when you had fraud inside a system, how do you unwind it? And that will give you a lot of hints about when there's fraudulent data inside the system, how you unwind it. But to add, add to that, there are a number of tools that the regulators do have. I think they're also thinking through what additional tools they need to have in response to a number of different scenarios. But the current tools they have today, obviously, would be, you know, assessing what is happening to the institution so that automatically triggers intense, you know, a dialogue. And just to be clear, for the large institutions, examiners are there on site. I mean, they're there every day of the week. So it's not as if they're just kind of parachuting in. Um, second, as a very blunt force instrument, they could, um, they could um, mandate a bank holiday, so they could they close the institutions, close the markets, if you will. That has its own complications and issues associated with that. We, we know from physical events, like Hurricane Sandy, you know, there was, that we did close the markets, you know, for, for, uh, for a few days in response to that. There have been other instances where we've, we've come close, you know, to closing the markets in response to different events that are occurring. Um, if it leads to a liquidity event, uh, the Federal Reserve, the discount window, you know, could be a tool, again, another blunt force, you know, tool. And then there's a special program that's been developed over the years called the Request for Technical Assistance, in which through the regulator, through Treasury, through DHS, a, a target or victim firm could receive specialized um, assistance from law enforcement and the intelligence agencies to help with forensics or help with response uh, to an event. Uh, again, that's a tool that takes time. It's not something that is going to help you resolve your problem overnight, but it is an additional layer of support that the government has been trying to build out, and we've been trying to socialize with uh, the institutions, their general counsel, so everyone's aware this program is, is it exists, and that if they need it, they're not in the position of trying to understand it or evaluating it, they would have already done that ahead of time. Yes. Several questions. Let's start with this one down here. Hi, I'm Alex Suffer with the FDIC. So a couple of you touched on this, but this is probably most relevant for Michael. 
We're currently at the start of the Internet of Things era, so we have many small networked and unpatched devices, which is probably the largest problem. Um, do we foresee there being constant and increasing DDoS attacks because of all these devices in the future? Are we going to be looking at internet services become increasingly unusable as a result of that? And if not, what measures are we taking or what would we be able to do to prevent that from happening? So the first is the conversation about all of these devices being compromised and used as a huge botnet for attacks was discussed 10 years ago. So th there was nothing surprising here besides that it was surprising. <laughs> uh, the second is, I think the number one measure towards security is people being aware of it. So I don't know if it's 100%, but definitely 99% of all attacks could have been avoided if people in that process would be security mindful when they write their software, when they decide their passwords, when they give someone else the right for authentication. The biggest issue with all of these devices, and none of the manufacturers or the people involved in this think security. They try to make it as user-friendly as possible. They rarely have uh, even a, an individual that in the company that cares about security, because no one, surprisingly to me, <laughs> thought that uh, some of them will be used for this. I think because of the magnitude of, or at least I hope that the magnitude of the event last week would start uh, having this conversation within those companies and then remove all the default passwords, which is extremely easy to do, it's just think about it, make sure that all of your data exchanges and all of your networks that don't have to be public don't, are not public, and there are so many procedural measurements you can take within this whole uh, ecosystem to prevent a lot of it. Now, it won't prevent everything. The more devices you have, the more DDoS, the more easy, easier it is to manifest a DDoS attack. But then, as technology evolves, it's also easier to protect and make sure you don't collapse uh, when it happens. Uh, so it's an evolution. But I think what happened, I, mean, I, I am positive that what happened will change uh, the perception of it. Just one very brief follow-up. I mean, I think it's interesting to think about the fact that there's uh, right now uh, there seems to be no liability, right? So that from a company's point of view, when they're manufacturing products and uh, and I install that product in my home and then it, it's used for a DDoS attack, the company is not liable for the fact that their uh, device got taken over. I'm not liable for the fact that I own the device that got taken over. So why is the company incentivized to spend any money uh, it, putting into place even basic security controls on the device? And why am I as an end user uh, going to take any steps to, to secure that device. And so I think either, you, you know, the, the liability question has to change or uh, policies and regulations have to be put into place to make sure that basic security practices are followed. And I, I would add another point there. It also raises issue for the, the pipes, you know, the ISPs. You know, what's their responsibility in this space? They would argue that they are dumb pipes. They have to deliver, you know, the, 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 the content. They can't filter the content. Um, we had a lot of issues in discussions with the ISPs after we had our series of DDoS attacks and said, you guys need to step up to the plate and do more in terms of filtering what's known malicious traffic and to drop it, that sort of thing. It also raises some issues, particularly when you're dealing with what's believed as a nation state attack from a policy perspective, what's the role of government in defending you know, the private sector or individuals? And that's a very complicated equation. I think the government has really struggled with that issue. I think what was very fascinating for me is that when the Sony Entertainment um, was attacked by the North Koreans, it was a destructive malware attack. It was the first time the government, you know, publicly responded, acknowledged it, and it stated the basis for which they were responding because it was an attack on a, on a media company and they didn't want that to uh, send a green light to any other adversary, whether it's Russia or someone else, that the United States government would not respond to that type of an event. So these types of things, it starts small in terms of all these different connected devices with no liability, very little responsibility. It can very quickly um, uh, cascade or escalate up to a very significant policy issue uh, that the government is still struggling with how to respond to. Maybe to add one thing for this. If you consider self-driving cars to be a huge IoT industry, if they won't protect it, and then all of a sudden you can have someone hack uh, 100,000 cars and drive them all into bridges, then first you have to solve the liability issue, because yeah. now it's not 
the internet went down for an hour, it's okay. Uh, it's, <laughs> no, but it, like when you compare the magnitude of these two events, it's not even at the same scale. I'm afraid we're out of time, um, and we have a coffee break that's, that's coming up right now. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for their uh, participation. <laughs>